Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing okay. Uh, today, we're going to relook at our vision for this year as a church. Um, at the beginning of September 2020, which feels like a lifetime ago, I shared this vision word that had been stirring in our hearts as a leadership. And today, I want to explore that a little bit further. But first, I need to take you on a little bit of the backstory. Um, it was in June 2019. Um, and we had an evening to set aside to do a community prayer walk um, outside Ebby. And I'll be honest, it started off in a place of disappointment for me because it was just me stood here outside Ebby. Um, and I started doing this negative internal thing, beating myself up a little bit. Um, and then at five past eight, Rosemary turned up. We decided we'd go on this prayer walk together. And we had a good time walking through Upper Hallfield, chatting about local situations, praying into them, asking God for God's breakthrough. Um, and then heading back to Ebby along Filton Avenue, I felt really strongly that God wanted to say, awaken his church and awaken his community. Now, I spoke this out loud to Rosemary because I felt really moved by this. And we prayed into it at that moment as we walked along Filton Avenue. We then reminisce of the thousands of people in our communities here that had been connected with Ebby over years. Many who come to faith, many that had journeyed through the church. Then I just held that word in my heart for over a year. In the summer of 2020, a few trigger points caused me to share that with the rest of the leadership team. And we felt that that was a word for now. God is wanting to awaken his church and awaken his community. It's not one or the other, but both parallel. So on our Vision Sunday in September 2020, we looked at this word. Um, and we delved into Ezekiel 37. Um, as we did, it reminded me of a prophetic word from many years ago that Rob Scott Cook brought to the church. He reminded us that when God breathes, it brings structure and brings life. And in Ezekiel 37, verse 5 and 6, it says in the message translation, God the Master told the dry bones, watch this, I'm bringing the breath of life to you and you'll come to life. I'll attach Sinai to you and put meat on your bones, cover you with skin and breathe life into you. You'll come alive and you'll realise that I am God. Ezekiel was taken into a, a valley of dry bones, a barren place where life didn't exist. And God asked uh, Ezekiel a question, a question that's often at the tip of our own tongues. Can what is lost be restored? Let's be honest, in the last 12 months, we've been all asking questions very similar to that. They're the wilderness questions. This picture of Ezekiel that God is uh, given to Ezekiel is that he wants to take what was once dead and bring back to life again. It's a picture of what Jesus himself has done for each one of us on the cross. It's a picture of what the Holy Spirit is doing taking our dry, broken bones, our, our lives, our dashed hopes, our unachieved aspirations, our failed dreams, and speaking life into them. He does that into us individually. As we come together, he awakens his church. There is hope. But God not only does that because he brings us together, we become a huge army a huge army to awaken his community. He's already doing stuff in his community. The narrative is already changing. He's preparing the way. Now, I shared a few statements that I felt um, were connected with awakening his church and awakening his community. I want to, as we start today, pray those. And I want to encourage you to pray them with me. They'll appear on the screen. So let's pray. Father God, we look to you and pray in faith that you will awaken your church with a fresh hunger and thirst for God. That you awaken your church with a prophetic voice. 
that you will awaken your church with a new season, that you will awaken your community as we persist in prayer, that you awaken your community as we intentionally share the whole of our lives, that you awaken your community with a holistic transformation of lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, these last eight weeks of lockdown number three, they've been really tough at many levels. On top of all that's happened over the previous nine months, our lives individually, but also together, can feel like we're in a wilderness. And today, I want to briefly unpack kind of a whistle-stop tour of how God seems to awaken his people through the Bible in journeys in the wilderness. And we're going to dip into four situations really quickly. I want to encourage you to look into these situations a lot more deeper than I'm going to cover today. Just to set some expectations, today is not about sharing strategy, but my prayer that it will help us reposition ourselves individually and together as we look forward. And helping us understand from God's perspective more that vision is shaped in wilderness. So firstly, let's look at the book of Exodus. We read about Moses' life story. He effectively spent much of his life in the wilderness. And it was there he learned to depend on God and not on his own gifts. Earlier on in his life, while he was doing his shepherding stuff, he had a holy moment in the wilderness. And in Exodus 3, we read this. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led to the flock in the far side of the wilderness and came to Horah, the mountain of God. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that the bush was on fire but did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight. Why does the bush not burn up? When the Lord saw that he'd gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place you're standing on is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. At this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. It was out in the wilderness that God revealed himself to Moses. That God revealed he knew him by name. It was a place of identity. It was a holy place, a marker point in Moses' life. Somewhere that he could look back to when he went on a journey of wandering. It was a personal marker holy point. And we all need those, because often when we're in wilderness times, we end up going round and round and round in circles. We need to remember those marker points where God revealed his identity, where God says, I know you by name. We look back at those holy moments, even when in a wilderness, it feels like God's silent even. But when we look back at the holy moments, we remember God is always present. So we keep seeking him. Further on in this um, story of Moses, we read about the journey where Moses is actually becomes the leader. He's leading the Israelite people out of Egypt and out of slavery. Leaving Egypt behind meant freedom for the, from Egyptian oppression but also leaving settled way of life. Even though it wasn't great, it was something they were used to. They moved into the wilderness and everybody was on Moses' side for a while. But it wasn't long before they questioned his leadership. Does he really know what he's doing? Does he really know where he's leading us? Even this God that that speaks to Moses, can God himself be trusted? Doubt creeps in in the wilderness. Maybe that's something you're experiencing or have experienced. I'll be honest with with you. For me as a a leader, my confidence over the last few years has been really battered. 
and over this last year, it's not been easy. I've seen anxiety hugely increase in my life. It's not something I've ever really struggled with. So, but I want to encourage you. For those, if you lead in church, if you lead in a workplace, in any situation where people are following you, I want to encourage you to hold on. Make sure you've got good people around you to encourage you. And find fresh ways to hang out with God. That's what Moses seemed to do. In the wilderness place, Moses found an intimacy with God in the wilderness. It says in Exodus 33 verse 11, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. I love two bits here, that, that Moses had that closeness with God and that Joshua got to hang out too. And Joshua didn't want to leave. Just as an aside, bring the next generation with you. Bring them into the place where you're hanging out with God because they will catch something there. It goes on in Exodus 33 to this conversation between God and Moses and God saying that his presence will go with Moses because he knew Moses by name. God awakened something in the wilderness very early on in Moses' life that sustained him during the 40 years of wandering. Secondly, we move on to Elijah. Elijah um, was a, a character who is an amazing story, get into that, um, where there's huge victory moments. On the top of Mount Carmel, there's that moment where he has a huge victory. But he also has these moments where he is suicidal. It's not often talked about, but that was real in Elijah's life. And everything in between. And this part of the story where Elijah enters um, the kind of scene in Israel, in 1 Kings 17, there was a load of idolatry going on in Israel's history, lots of not very good stuff. And it says this, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew or nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kerith ravine, east of Jordan. You will drink from the brook and I have ordered the ravens to feed you there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kerith ravine, east of the Jordan and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening and he drank from the brook. Sometime later the brook dried up because there'd been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath of Sidon and stay there. I have commanded a widow in there to supply you with food. Elijah prophetically announced to the king, he announced God's judgment, a drought on the land. But then God sends Elijah to the brook. Elijah has to fresh has to flesh out these prophetic words with prophetic action in a dry and a barren place. Elijah's name means the Lord is my God. And that's the centre of his message. He has to live out words and action. The name of the brook called Kerith, it means drought. Elijah prophesied drought and now he's heading to drought. Now this is strange because... Elijah um, makes this dramatic entrance into his, Israel's history and then God speaks again and sends him out to a place called Kerith. It's not actually to hide from Queen Jezebel, um, but the Hebrew word for hiding in this passage can be more accurately translated as absent yourself. He was sent away to be shaped by God, to absent himself, to be shaped by God. In developing his character, God was going to do some even greater things. In the place of wilderness, Elijah was alone. He was dependent on God, and God shaped his character. Now, that might be, not be a new thing to you, 
It might not be a new thing to realise that, that God is more interested in our character than he is in our gifting. In the dry and wilderness place, God is shaping Elijah because the only thing that Elijah can do is depend on God. Thirdly, I want to point out right in the middle of the Bible that the Psalms are full of songs of wilderness. Where the Israelites are reminded of their own history, looking back, it unlocks thankfulness throughout. The, the Psalms are these kind of songbook of, the, um, of worship, a songbook of real life journeys. They're full of really raw emotions, yet threads of hope and thankfulness throughout. And in Psalm 84, verses 5 and 6, it says this. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose heart are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they will become, make a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. Psalm 84 is a song of pilgrimage. It's about going on a journey. Outside of Jerusalem was this um, area, this valley called the Valley of Baca. Most travellers had to pass through the valley on their journey towards Jerusalem. And Bible scholars, they say that they believe it was a, a rubbish stump and that travellers had to pass by. Other Bible scholars kind of say that the name Baca comes from the name from the Bazaum tree. And Bazaum trees grew in dry places. So it's believed that the Valley of Baca was a harsh, dry, wilderness place that would really test the patience of travellers as they journeyed to meet with God in the temple in Jerusalem. Baca itself, as a word, also means weeping in the Hebrew language. So it was a place of sorrow. Many of us are probably going through a Valley of Baca right now. Maybe we've been through one, even in the last year. But the key phrase in this psalm, this psalm of remembering, of giving thanks, is that we pass through. We journey through. God journeys with us. We can look back and worship God as we look back at those valley of backers and we remember God's faithfulness in sticking with us. But we can also find ways to worship God in the valley of Baca, in the wilderness. The final snapshot I want to bring to you is of Jesus himself. In Luke 4, we read these words. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil he ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. Then we read of some of the temptations and challenges in the wilderness until we get to verse 14, which says this, Jesus returned to the Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, his hometown, where he was brought up, and on the Sabbath, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. That's why at this time of year even that people often will reflect and pray, give up stuff during Lent in this place of giving up stuff in lead up to Easter. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, led by the Spirit into the wilderness. That doesn't make sense. It was just after his baptism. You'd think it'd be the perfect time to kind of go all out with some miracles and so start his ministry, kind of all big, 
stuff happening. Instead, he spent 40 days being tested and tempted. It sounds harrowing, but he didn't return burnt out. He didn't need a break, but he came full of the power of the Holy Spirit to begin his ministry. The wilderness was an absolutely essential part of Jesus' life. His manifesto that we've just read there, Jesus' vision was birthed in the wilderness. This encourages me that God not only shapes us, but can awaken his vision in us in the wilderness. So as we look at all these situations this morning, I realise it's been really fast moving and I haven't gone into a lot of depth. But we see that in the wilderness, God is shaping us because our dependence is on him. In the wilderness, our identity is called out. In the wilderness, we can remember the holy moment marker points in our lives, those defining moments. In the wilderness, prophetic action leads to God shaping our characters. In the wilderness, we find a closeness and intimacy with God that can surprise us. It might not move us, though, but it will sustain us. God awakens his church in the wilderness and he awakens his community. So for us, for Ebi, God is awakening his church. It's a personal thing, as I've already said, but also a together thing. We may be dispersed, but we are together. God did the same in his early church, in the book of Acts. They were dispersed. It was for different reasons. But he awakened his church. They grew in depth. They grew in numbers. They grew in influence. God is awakening his church. He's awakening his church as we choose to worship him. Remembering what he has done in the valley of Baca. In every season of life, celebrating his faithfulness. And we're all at different places in this wilderness season. God will be doing different things in you to what he's doing in me. He brings us together and he breathes on us. Remember, he breathes on us and we become a huge army. Like in that valley of dry bones where we started this morning. God awakens his church and our response is letting God use us to awaken his community. He's already preparing the ground. He's already preparing stuff. And our prayer is, come release your church in the power of the Holy Spirit to live out Jesus' manifesto in Hallfield, Lockleys, Filton, in our neighbourhoods where we live, to see the whole transformation of people's lives To see all the good stuff of God's kingdom, of the kingdom of God brought on this earth. To see this church with churches around this city continually reproducing the life of Jesus in our communities for his glory. God, would you come? Would you continue to awaken your church? Would you continue to awaken your community? Let's pray. Let's pray. I want to pray these words of a, of a song that's just been in my head. And maybe this is specific for some, but for all of us. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters. Whatever you would call me, take me deeper than my feet would ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Saviour. Holy Spirit, revive your church, awaken your church, call out 
the identity of who we are individually and together. And release your church in the power of the Holy Spirit to fill your manifesto for your community. Lord, would you awaken your church and awaken your community. In Jesus' name.